Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty funny when Kate was saying that uh, she was uh, putting forward what might be perhaps an odd vision, because I was like, oh, man, if that's odd, I'm about to, I'm about to be the weirdest dude in the world. But OK, I started thinking mostly along the lines of what is the purpose of adolescent education? Right, so if you think like sort of world history, uh, it's a little weird that we spend a bunch of time in formal education settings with like 13 to 18 year olds um, because, you know, you know, just like put them in a trade, like they're learning how to make tables now or doing things like that. Like, like it's sort of a, we're, we're a bit unique in the, that we've, we've sort of created this stage that is like years and years long of this like sort of liminal, like I'm, you know, not a girl, not yet a woman kind of situation. Um, but, you know, it's a thing that we're doing. And so I, I, the question that I, I, I've been thinking about is, you know, wh what is this for? Like, what are we trying to do? Because um, it turns out it's not really job training, right? Like, a lot of people think of high school education as, like, you know, this is your, like, you're getting ready to be in the workforce. But, like, I don't know. A lot of you probably have jobs. I doubt most of the things that you do in your job you learned about in high school or even really college, right? You sort of show up and you get trained and you, like, figure it out in your first six months working and you're like, ah, and then eventually it kind of makes sense, maybe. Um, and it's also not fact memorization. It, it's not the primary thing for adolescent education, right? Like, all, I didn't even bother to, like, find a particular study because, like, you know, th talking about, like, brain, brain plasticity and stuff like that, right? A lot of your fact memorization is going to come in before you're hitting the adolescent stage. Like, you know, if you talk to a six-year-old, they're, like, obsessed with just knowing random stuff. You talk to a four-year-old, they're obsessed with knowing random stuff. Galen I think every time I've seen him over the last like three months has has just recited all of the planets and their relative sizes. That's like. I don't know what you did to draw that straw, but it's <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so it's probably not fact memorization in the way that we really want to see fact memorization being a major thing in lower school. Um, and the study that I did find that is fascinating to me is it's, it's not even necessarily skill acquisition. Um, there was an article in Developmental Science from a few years ago about um, basically doing sequence learning, uh, which is just a, a way that people will, uh, uh, behavioral psychologists and stuff like that, will measure uh, how well you will pick up a new skill like, and do things. Um, and it's like basically through the sort of speed at which you can recognize sequences, predict um, items and sequences that will come later, um, all that kind of stuff. And apparently that peaks at around age 12 and then drops off. So like most of your like uh, sort of uh, superstar people in the world of like sports and all those kinds of things, like they're going to have started learning a lot of their skill acquisitions for those particular things before they turn 12 because apparently that drops off really hard after you turn 12. So that surprised me because I was like, oh, it's got to be that we're just like teaching them skills and stuff. So it's not that either. So. I, I'm not sure what's left at that point. So I'm, I'm going to say a crazy thing that I'm actually not totally convinced is true yet. I'm, it's, a, it's a working theory. Um, I think that maybe high school education is not primarily intellectual. Uh, and I say this for a few reasons. As I've been interacting with a lot of my freshmen this year in logic, I found this really interesting thing to be true. None of them actually intellectually struggle with the content. like. Because it, it helps that it's logic, so it's the sort of thing that if you just walk it out for a person, like and explain it in detail, they'll be like, "Yeah, that makes sense. It follows because it—that's what it does. Logic follows by necessity from premises to conclusions." But the thing that I found that is most lacking in the students that are having a hard time is like sometimes courage. Like they're scared of getting answers wrong, so they just don't try. Um, sometimes it's perseverance. They like don't want to focus for as long as they need to to figure something out. Like, I had a student literally on Friday. I, I figured out, like, sh like, she will tune out if I am making eye contact with her and talking like this. Like, she will still somehow just, like, disappear while in the middle of a conversation. Unless I talk at this volume constantly while maintaining eye contact the whole time. <laughs> then she has no choice but to pay attention to me. And so I did this to talk her through an entire problem that we were working on in class that she kept being like, this is too hard. I don't know how to do this. I'm like, OK. First, you're going to do this. And then I recorded it on my computer and made an audio file that I emailed to her 
because every single problem is done the same way. So now she has a three minute audio file of me yelling exactly how step by step to do a particular kind of logic problem so that maybe <laughs> it will give her enough of a, a, a sort of, a, I don't know, a influx of perseverance to be able to do this on her own without just like getting bored three seconds in and not being able to pay attention. So. This is developed into what I now have as a working theory that like the primary thing that they're learning is virtues, not intellectual abilities, like not intellectual skills. Because they have what they need already to do pretty much anything that they're gonna need to do, but what they don't have is the ability to do those things well, do those things with virtue. Um, I'm not sold on this, so like, I, I know this is being recorded and this is a parent conference talk, but like don't quote me on that, I might change my mind in like six months, uh, it's just a thing I'm thinking about. Um, because we do know that we certainly want to produce students that are literate and that are numerate, that are confident and competent writers and speakers and thinkers, right? Those are all things that are very important to us. But um, those things are also all things that we're already working on in primary levels of education, wherein, you know, if sort of current research, as I understood it, as a sort of layperson just reading scientific journals is to be understood, like, it's gonna be more effective at younger ages, a lot of the sorts of things uh, that we're doing. Um, so are we just doing it again, like, and more intensely? Is it just like, is, is high school just like, you know, elementary school the sequel? I, I don't think so, I think it's different. Um, and I think that the main thing that we are doing across the US, in any school, even though I have not yet met another school administrator that thinks this is what they're doing, is uh, we are providing an extended rite of passage that is inviting children into adulthood. I think junior high, high school, like adolescent ed education in general, is itself the project of an extended rite of passage that brings children into adulthood. Um, this is interesting because we as a culture don't really have much in the way of rites of passage. Rites of passage are very, very important. Uh, everyone's done them for forever, except us for some reason. Uh, Right, the, the whole goal of a rite of passage is, okay, you're a kid, you're doing kid stuff, right? At some point you need to become an adult. And it, being an adult is very different than being a kid and you need to be sort of ushered through a full identity shift that takes you from your childhood to your adulthood. Um, that's a thing, I don't know if you've ever tried to do a full identity shift on yourself uh, at any point in time. Um, that's hard to do. It's really, really hard to do. Uh, I imagine it would be especially hard to do when you're a literal child, right? Like, you, you, mind-blowing that we expect them to do this. But I think, I think we kind of do, right? Like, so if you're, if you're looking in, you know, like Sparta, for instance, you get the whole, like, kid sent out into the wild with all of his other kid friends. They have to, like, what is it? They're killing a lion or something like that? I don't remember, John. Is it a wolf? That would make sense, yeah. They have to go and like kill a wolf. Uh, I think they get like the tip of a spear and they have to actually make it uh, with the spear themselves and they're surviving in the woods for a weekend and all this. We're not doing any of that, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but right, there's this, there's, but there's this particular process that's being followed throughout all rites of initiation that we have in world history, right? So you have a kid taken out of their normal context and they're put into, uh, they're taken out of that normal context and they're, they're take, the, the identity child is taken away from them. Right, so even the fact that we use a word like adolescent is putting them in this weird liminal space. Like child is a pretty definite category, adult's a pretty definite category, adolescent, meh, somewhere in the middle. Um, so we're taking them out of the normal context. context. Um, you know, the average high school is probably not a normal context, so you know, that could already work. Um, giving, taking away this identity, giving them this new sort of transitionary identity, then we put them into artificial communities with other liminal persons. So. A great books class, a house, your grade at school, whatever clubs you're in, if you're in a public school, like, you know, all of those different things. Um, then those groups are given challenges and feats to accomplish, right? Such that at the other side of those challenges and feats, they earn some new mystery, right? This mystery has something to do with what it means to be an adult. So like you have um, finished your killing of the wolf and now you are invited to know this sort of important secret that all of the adults in your culture know that you didn't get to know before because you were a child. Um, then you are given the identity of adult, you're brought back home, everyone now treats you like an adult rather than a kid, hooray, you're an adult, right? It's, a, it's pretty formulaic, but it works really well and people have been doing it for forever. Um, I would argue that 
in a school, this is always happening throughout the course of an adolescent education. But the dangerous thing is that I think it's happening unintentionally in like 99.9% .9 of schools. Like they're just kind of doing stuff that they've received from, you know, whatever they experienced when they were in high school, who, you know, that was set up based on whatever they experienced when they were in high school. And it's just kind of this accidental, like we stumbled into what we all do. Um, and so it works into this weird, uh, unthoughtful definition of adulthood that we as a culture tend to use that is bad. Yeah, it's just bad, right? Like, th think about uh, how do you define an adult? Like, what makes someone an adult? I think if you were to ask someone that generally, it's... Okay, Pay your paying your bills, good. Financial independence, right? Uh, financial independence and responsibility, okay. Um, Let's think. Was Jesus an adult? Probably at some point in his life. What was it about him? He had no place to lay his head. Um, he lived off of the charity of others. Um, you know, he was, he was a carpenter before he began his ministry. He did have a job, and then suddenly he didn't have a job because he was doing something else. Um, I would argue that Obviously, as parents, we definitely want all of our kids to be financially stable on their own someday. I would argue, though, that that's not a good definition of what it is to be an adult. I think it's one that we all assume is a good definition of being an adult. I, I don't think it's a good one, because I think you could take it away, right? Uh, I don't know what you guys know about necessary and sufficient causes and logic, right? I think that um, it, no, I think it's neither necessary nor sufficient. So never mind. I'm not going to do that. But. Uh, yeah, like I, I just think you could take it away if you could take a definition if you could take a definition away from a person with an identity and then they still have that identity. Suddenly, it doesn't work as a definitive thing. So, I think financial independence, while it's important, while my dad thinks of himself as wildly successful simply because I have a job, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that that is what it is to be an adult. Okay, let's try another one. I know that there are two more, like for sure, and I think I know what they are already. Anybody? Adulthood. What's adulthood? Raise a family. Raise a family. Good. Okay. So raise a family. This is tied in a lot. And raise a family is kind of like the Christianized version of this secular uh, definition of adulthood, which is just, I think, achieving sex. Right? You have this idea that if you haven't had sex yet, you're not an adult. There's the whole movies about this, right? Like, that I don't recommend. But, <laughs> you know, it's like kids going on their journey to become adults by losing their virginity, right? Or... If you're in a church setting, ask your single friend how easy it is to be a single person in the church. Ask them if they've been infantilized by the church and the people around them. Probably they have. Because we often think in the church context that getting married is the thing that makes you into a real grown-up. And you're not a real grown-up until you've been married. Um, so, you know, we're not all high church here, but like, yeah, church hierarchs are all unmarried. <laughs> What a weird thing if, like, Bishop Thomas is not an adult because he's not married. Like, that seems clearly false. Okay. Any other ones? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Now you're saying, now you're saying good ones. I like that one. I like that one. Being, being responsible for your own moral choices. Yeah. I like that. I think that's good. Um, yeah. Often, often it's 18, yeah. Yeah, it's like a magical boom, hits midnight, you buy a pack of cigarettes and a scratcher, and you're an adult, right? Like, <laughs> whoo! Like, which I don't know if anyone's ever met an 18-year-old, but it is not in itself sufficient for the uh, coming of adulthood. Um, so I, I'd like to argue that there is, it ends up being kind of difficult to define adulthood. Um, I, have, I have some ideas. I think that, one, one signifier between childhood and adulthood is that adults are meaningly free where children are not, right? Like we give adults, we don't give adults, adults have by nature of who they are liberty, right? Like they make their own choices. Uh, they, they do what they want to do. Kids, we do not grant that liberty to for many obvious reasons, right? Like child wants to, I don't know, like touch a stovetop because they're curious or what was, who was it that burned themselves on the light bulb of a lava lamp recently? Was it, 
I think it was one of the Bartell kids. Tim was telling me that like they had this rule about like don't touch the lava lamp because they got a lava lamp in their room. They think it's really cool. They really want to touch it. They said don't touch it. Roman apparently screwed the top off of the lava lamp and got to the light bulb on the inside and then touched it and then immediately ran into his parents' room crying. And they're like, what'd you do? And he's like, I touched the lava lamp. And he's like, I told you not to do that. And he's like, I know, I just really wanted to. Um, right, so we try to take away freedom from children in that regard because they aren't yet able to take care of themselves, right? So we take away their freedom so that they can be safe, um, so that they can make better choices than they might otherwise make. Like hopefully, if you have a student that just refuses to turn in homework, then many of their freedoms at home are taken away until they turn in that homework, right? Otherwise, they might never fix themselves because they're not strong enough of character to do so. You as the adult have to stand in the gap for them and be the strong character, right? Um, I think this is also true of authority, right? Adults have authority in a place that children don't. Um, I always think of the scene from Hook where it's like the kids are asking what they're in charge of and it's like the, you know, the, the adult is then there's like the little kid and then there's like the littler one and the littler one. And then the littlest one's like, wait, what, what am I responsible for? And Peter Pan's like, uh, the never bugs, little ones. Um, but eventually you get down to a size where you're like, you're not an authority on anything because you're a baby, right? Uh, we don't give children lots of authority. And as we do give them some authority, that's in many senses giving them a bit more of their pieces of adulthood. Um, I think a third one, uh, and the one that's very obvious to see is uh, identity, right? Adults have control over their identity in a way that children don't. Um, and so this is why I think you always see like, you know, as, as children in the process of becoming adults, they'll start to like, suddenly dress really differently or like dye their hair or like, I don't know, what other weird things to kid? I, you know, they're, they suddenly they're like listening to new, to new music and that music is their entire personality and they've decided that. I and mean, it's not actually their entire personality, but they're like, yeah, like for me, I was an emo kid, right? So it was like, you know, like the eyeliner, the skinny jeans, the whatever. I was like, yeah, that's me now. I'm sad. <laughs> sad is my identity. But it's, it's an important and a healthy thing because what you're doing is you're acting out like your desire to take control of your own identity. And that's a thing that kind of, again, progresses through as you go from childhood to adulthood. Um, I think it's also the case that like, there's an amount of suffering that an adult has to face um, by nature of being an adult that most adults that love the children in their lives, they will try to shield them from as much of that suffering as possible. Um, they'll be able to tell what is and isn't an appropriate amount of that suffering to handle, and they will shield the child from as much suffering as they can or as much as is appropriate. Um, and again, as you become an adult, you are suddenly now responsible for handling your own suffering. Uh, you don't have anyone to shield you from it, right? I, I was recently at a conference where uh, I was with a bunch of youth leaders. They were all talking about how how important it was that they were the line that sort of stood between the slings and arrows of the enemy and all the terrible things that might happen and the kids that they love. And it's like, man, that's kind of true. And like, I know for a fact that if all the teachers at the school could for the rest of our lives, like throw our bodies in the way of all of the pain that our students might undergo, we would do it like willingly, gladly, anytime. But that's just not reality, right? At some point your child will leave suddenly they're an adult, and they have their own suffering to deal with. Uh, and I think this is also true of doubt, right? Like, we, we like to provide kids with answers in a way that, like, you can't really do with an adult. When someone's an adult and they have a question and it's, like, a really big question and they have doubts, you just, adults sit with their doubt in a way that kids don't have to because parents will answer questions for them. So I think that all of these things are hallmarks of what it means to be an adult and the way you differentiate childhood from adulthood which is why we have retreats that are themed after all of these things that students will do throughout the course of the year, uh, or the course of their four years in high school specifically. Um, so in high school retreat, every year we have a theme, uh, we have four rotating themes that we're gonna move through as years go on, um, such that you, know, you start in one and by the time you're a senior, you will have been through all four and then we can start over and then no one will, you know, that's how rotations work. Um, <laughs> So this last year we did a retreat on liberty, um, wherein, again, this is it, the rites of passage thing when you're thinking about youth ministry, it's like, you know, within, it's like wheels within wheels, right? Like you have rites of passage nestled within rites of passage. So a retreat is a really good general form of a rite of passage, right? You take all the kids away from all their stuff they're familiar with, 
lock their phones in bags, they all get mad. Uh, and then suddenly, they show up somewhere and you put them into a new group of people, right? So for the, the back to school retreats that we do with the high schoolers, it's always their houses. Um, students don't spend a lot of time in their house groups uh, most of the time. And so this is like a new group for them to do uh, and to be around and to learn to be with. And then we put them into weird challenges that I make up for them such that, you know, they're just running around answering riddles and doing difficult things that require them all to work together and they don't work together very well, so they start yelling at each other. It's all very formative and important, um, right? And then once they've overcome those challenges, we start to unfurl these new wonders and the wonders are very much themed after like whatever we're looking at on that particular retreat. So this last year it was Liberty. So we watched a movie called The Iron Giant. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's amazing. It's a great uh, movie about liberty, to think about freedom. Um, it's this, this robot that is programmed to be this like Russian spy killer robot. It's set during like the Red Scare. Uh, so it's set to be this like, you know, scary combat robot thing, but it has a will and it ends up developing a relationship. Like it, it loves this little boy that it's friends with. And so it ends up like insisting that despite his programming, he will not be a gun. Like he will not be a thing that's bringing death to other people. Instead, he will like serve the people that he loves. And so there's this real like rich, uh, formative like set of things that you can think about what it means to be free. Like what it means to be meaningly free, not just from external controls, like from your parents and from your schools and from whatever, but from your own vice, right? Like from the own brokenness and wickedness inside of you. How to be free from that such that you are free to make the good decisions you wanna make. Um, so, you know, we watched that movie gave them a bunch of good talks. They like went and watched the sunset at one point. Like all of these wonders, we, uh, we invited them, not invited them, forced them, <laughs> thus inviting them, uh, to spend half an hour in silence by themselves. Or an hour, sorry, yeah, we do an hour. I forgot, it's, a, it's an hour. So like we basically were like, hey, here's what it is to uh, be in silence and pray, go. And then we just kind of like paced around making sure that kids weren't goofing around. And, Caught a bunch of them goofing around, and you know, that's how it goes, you, little by little. Um, but it, this whole thing then serves, right? And then we, at the end of this week of retreat, we commission them, we talk to them about the freedom that they have, we talk to them about why it's important, we talk about how they should use it, um, and then we tell them, like, we want to treat you as meaningfully free. So as much as we are able to at this school, we will from now on. Now, as soon as you start doing crazy things and you are showing that you're not in control of yourselves, we will indeed now reinstitute controls. But our goal from the moment that we tell them all those things about liberty is that they will then just be meaningfully free in their time at school. Uh, and that plays itself out in the way that we do privileges and things at the school, right? Like um, for any of you that have or know like younger kids, like third grade is a big year to be at the St. Constantine School because third grade is the year that you get to start doing field day. And like kids will lose their minds. <laughs> Like, I have kids that, like, literally the first day of school ran up to me and were like, this is my year. I get to do field day this year. I'm like, great. Good for you. Congratulations. Um, and so there's this real, like, you're graduating into a new level of authority. You're gra graduating into a new le level of freedom, um, right? Like, as you are getting older, like, you start to earn, like, oh, you can have a free period now. Or, oh, this new retreat is one that you get to go on now. Or the, now you get to go to these dances. Now you get to do these things. There's this continual, like, sort of upward trajectory of, freedom of authority of all of these things. Um, and so we're thinking about all of these different categories as we're constructing all of the different things that we're doing throughout the year. It's again, like sort of wheels within wheels. Imagine that whole rite of passage structure and then shrunk down into each individual event and moved forward, right? Like this last year, uh, we started doing our man night and woman night for the first time, which again, yeah, it was so fun. But was this same kind of thing again, shrunk down again? We you know, with the men, we realized we need to talk to them about what it means to be a man, what it means to um, wield your power and authority well, right? And you have a certain amount of strength that just comes on, comes with you both culturally and biologically as, as a sort of gift of being a man. And there's a huge weighty responsibility that comes with that. And we wanted to talk to them about that and show them that and also throw logs around a field with them doing that. So it was great. Um, you know, wrestle them, all sorts of things. Uh, I played, uh, this is just a side note, but it was really fun. I played tackle football with a bunch of the high schoolers on uh, Thursday and it was a treat. So if you ever, if you ever need a real pick me up for yourself, go play tackle football with high schoolers. Uh, turns out that being a grown man makes it uh, 
a lot easier to do really well at that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so right in that we're talking about authority. We talk about authority again in our junior senior retreat. It's all of these continuously upward moving events that are not, only very rarely are we giving um, like intellectual speeches about the things that we're trying to teach them. Instead, we're modeling all of these things for them. We're putting adults in their lives that we think like, hey, when you grow up, this would be an okay person for you to try to be like. Um, we, we put all those people in their lives and show them to them, and we walk them through all of these different steps of what it means to be an adult. We unfurl the mysteries and wonders of adulthood slowly but surely before them, such that right, you get this whole culminating experience, I think really with the junior-senior retreat, where you... You're seeing, like the seniors, especially the ones that have been here with us for forever, they, like, they've heard all of these things, they've experienced all of these things, they've seen all of these ways in which they are welcomed into the task of being an adult rather than being a child. And we, at that retreat, it's heartbreaking. Like, it is so hard uh, every year. Like, we have all of the teachers, like, I send out a thing, and we all, like, write them prayers that we're, like, thinking, of, like, thinking for them and blessings that we want to give them, and we you know, on the last day of retreat, we'll like hand them a little packet and say like, look, you're, you're done. Like you, you have like, you know, I guess you have finals and stuff still, but like, this is the last big thing that you're doing with us. And you are now going out to the world and you know what it looks like to be in charge of other people, right? Like you uh, being a senior have sort of, we, we've watched you, um, delight in helping the pre-k-3 eat food every once in a while and run around the field giving second graders piggyback rides and playing soccer with them like we've seen you be an authority for all of these young students we've seen you be meaningfully free and like start to make these choices like the other really fun thing about junior senior retreat is we have almost no rules on that retreat because they just don't need them they're all so delightful they just like go and spend time with one another being delightful it's the best um and so they've hit this like peak of liberty they've hit this peak of authority they've hit this peak of like you know like their identity they've really started to kind of like hone in more on who they are it's really funny seeing like junior hires become high schoolers and especially going into like sophomore they start trying all like the really weird stuff that they're going to do like they're like this is me now and you're like huh but normally by the time they're around senior year you start to see them kind of level out a little bit more some of them are still trying some stuff but you know they're starting to level out towards the identity that they want for themselves um they they know who they are a lot of them have like suffered um and a lot of that is like controlled suffering that we give them on purpose uh you know shout out to the eighth grade pe class that was doing wind sprints in the hot sun on thursday uh i don't know if you heard complaints about that but uh it was pretty funny um not funny it was good for them uh it was also fun to watch um Right, and, or, or the suffering of like, and the endurance that comes with just, you have to read a really long book and you have to be able to focus through reading a really long book or writing a hard paper and doing calculus or failing like, oh man, like I, one of, one of, I had a student a few years ago that just like totally panicked during her logic final and like shut down and couldn't do anything and just like ran out of the room and like, it was this real moment of like, I went and found her and was like, hey, like, I, I will give you another chance to do this because I know you know these things. Like, let's go do them. Like, here, this is the time limit. We're going to go do it. And I think for her, like that moment of getting to like be totally, like totally swept up and undone by a challenge that was too big for her and then given another chance to do it and know that she can do it and like ace the, she aced the final. It was fine. Like she knew what she was doing. Like was such an important moment of suffering and perseverance. And so we, we build in all of these things such that we hope that by the time students are seniors, they know that they've done all of these things already and that they are being commissioned to go do them even better. And they will go and be the sorts of adults that we know that they can be and that we want to see them be. Um, because it'll get to the point where we just can't protect them anymore. And we have to make sure that they are ready to go and be virtuous and good adults. So that's the kind of overall vision of, in case you ever wondered, like, you know, why is Mr. Yee wearing, like, short shorts when he's in the pickup line today? It's, you know, it's because it's during Spirit Week. There's, like, a whole thing. It, like, it, it's all, I promise I'm thinking about lots of things as we set this up. And that's the end goal, right? The end goal is that somehow all of these movements that we do through joy and feasting and difficulty and classes and weird challenges that frustrate them on retreats and all of these things is, is all set in this movement towards making a virtuous adult who is ready to be a virtuous adult when they graduate from our school. Um, 
that's the game plan. That's what we're working on. That's what we're doing.